Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am Oddly Chat Show. Uh, this is episode 216. If you've seen them all, write me at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. I know some doctors that can help you. Buffering gag never gets tired. Hey, Here's a question for you. How do you do the show? Um, let us know. Write to us at contact at KevinPollockChatshow.com. Let us know how you do the show, why you do the show, how you'd like to fix the show. What's wrong with the show? We want to hear from you. We refuse to read the comment section. So write to us directly. Have the nerve, the gumption, the wherewithal, the moxie. Uh, joining me as always, our very own uh, Sam Levine. Well, <laughs> we only paid him for the one word today. <laughs> but we're gonna loop it. We're gonna loop just, the shit out of it. We only paid for the one just, meep. Just hire Vin Diesel. He'll say the same thing a hundred times for you. It seems like you're referring to a, a, a very specific film, in which this film. happened. Film. No, no, no. No. In, in real life, he'll just do that for you. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask you this. How many China balls must swing before? <laughs> uh, we're coming to you live from the Westwood One studio for our second out of three episodes that we'll be doing from this location <laughs> <laughs> because we were cordially invited to not let the door hit us in the ass on the way out. Here's the thing. It's, yes. It's my fault. Well, this is why I'm looking at you. I left I, one too many crumbs <laughs> behind. I did not realize they had working bathrooms elsewhere in the building. Ah, you made your own. You chose a spot. I chose a spot. Uh -huh. I thought it was fine. Sure. I, I glanced at a passing office employee. She nodded at me like, go ahead. We all do it there. Right. Evidently. You took the paper in with them. It was very not the evident. Case. Not the case. <laughs> not the case. I, I think it was the boss's office. Well, listen, I say if you're going to get uh, the heave ho, yeah. make it for a damn good reason. Yeah. The same reason why I told you from the beginning, Samuel. If you're going to suck a dick, yep. make sure it's the right one. <laughs> Did I not say that from day I'm, one? I'm still working on it. Oh, well. It's a, it's, unfortunately, it's a process of elimination. <laughs> I feel rejected. Yeah. Yeah. I've taken too many shots in the mouth. It's getting late. <laughs> now, for those of you who aren't aware, <laughs> Sam's parents watch each and every episode Oh, that's right. My live. mother just heard me make that joke. Live. Yep. Mm. Yep. Mm -mm. No question about it. Mm -hmm. Horrified in our living room in New Jersey as we speak. Now, the last night, the three of us attended uh, uh, the second night of a potentially historic event happening at the Hollywood Bowl uh, called The Simpsons Take the Bowl. And they did a live stage show with clips and musical numbers and gay choruses and a giant... Uh, <laughs> It was one gay chorus. Oh, just the one? Yes. But at he one point, like there were 7,500 were... men on stage, so yes. it seemed like many choruses got together. Um, and by got together, I think you know <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> the password is centipede. Um, Ooh, dark. Yeah, why not? <laughs> it's our second or third show here. We've already been shown the door. We are really just sitting fire to this bridge yeah. on our way out. And... Um, as soon as I can bump off Kathy Griffith, Griffin, sure, <laughs> I'll uh, be the number one draw among the homosexual audience worldwide. What about you? Get a Chelsea Handler and Margaret Cho. Fuck. Yeah, you got a lot. I've got, got a work lot. to do. You got a lot of work to do. I've got dames to kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go. Let's go round robin, as it were, or just around Sam, uh, to find out what three reviews. Let's get three reviews from the f uh, second of only three shows. The Simpsons have ever done live at the Hollywood Bowl. It began Friday. The second one was last night. Our friend Hank Azaria, former guest of this show, um, hosted the damn thing. And uh, tonight's the last show. Jamie, I'm going to start with you. Yes. My review? Yes, please. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I think my um, highlights were, as you mentioned, the gay men's chorus. They did a nice little medley. They just, they sang the Stonecutter song and Spider Pig and See My Vest. Yes, amazing. And they also sang the Monorail song with Conan. And I liked Conan uh, 
giving shit to the uh, t- the season ticket holders. <laughs> yeah, that front area with the best seats in the bowl. Yeah, he's like, these people don't even care. Yeah. <laughs> Why are they playing cartoons, he said. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was fun. And Hank did a great job. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. Sammy, over to you. I'll second most of what Jamie just said. Hank did a tremendous job. Conan did a great job. And he was not kidding about the shit he was giving to the people in the pool circle there. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as the show started to wind down for the fireworks finale, they were all built. They were all gone. It's as if they had a meeting prior and said, when well, the fireworks the begin. Hmm? Yeah. It's their own fault. They missed Do the Bart Man. <laughs> yeah, they did miss Do the Bart Man. Um, well, that took uh, me back. The number one song <laughs> written by Michael Jackson for The Simpsons. That's right. As we learned. Some uh, of us learned. From Simpsons but Sing the Blues. The, uh, the two highlights <laughs> for me would be um, uh, Conan doing Monorail and uh, Stonecutters. Sammy, uh, <clears throat> I read in the trades today. Yep. They did a, put out a special Sunday did edition. They? Yep. Yeah. That uh, there may have been a couple that sat in front of you and J Mac last mm-hmm. night. Mm hmm. And the guy uh, of the couple could not uh, get out of your face. Oh, I, I have vague memories of that. Vague? Yes. I have vague memories. Because it seems like he wouldn't let up from the story I read. Yeah, you know. <laughs> As your fans do. This is what we do for a living. Well, and this is the business we've chosen. Sometimes there's collateral damage in that you pay several hundred dollars to watch a show, and instead you get to see a drunk guy... Um, all up in your grill, who, honestly, what bothered me way more Mm -hmm. than sitting down next to me on my bench and taking multiple photos, what bothered me way more than that (laughs) was how loud he was during the show. Sure. And in the split second before the punchline, which we all knew was going to happen because we're all big fans, he would shout it out! (laughs) And you... (laughs) Would you say this had nothing to do with why the show wasn't amazing to you? No, I had very little to do with it. <laughs> I beg to differ. Here's what else I'd like to beg. Yeah. Spend- I feel him on this, though, because I, whenever I go to uh, my Disney theme parks, we have it's a very similar thing that us um, Disney nerds like to refer to as script reciters. Yes. And these are people that it's like, I know the, you know, I know the entire script of The Haunted Mansion. You don't hear me reciting it. Or the you know, Cruise. but they feel the need to yeah. recite it along with you know the voiceover, and it's like, no, shut up. Doctor Albert Falls, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um. So, so this guy, did you get any photos with your camera? Because it seemed like they were all taken with his. They were all taken with his camera. So you had nothing to show <laughs> us, because that would have been really good. I'm so sorry. In <laughs> fact, I I, to, I told a I told a, a bald faced lie. Uh-huh. Uh huh. They wanted to tag me in all these photos, and I told them I was not on social media. <laughs> wow. They did very little research. Well, <laughs> you are social media. I'm not really. I'm no. actually pretty standoffish. Huh. Because I follow you on Instagram and Facebook. Do you? Nope. No. <laughs> I'm not even on Instagram. Um, well, thank you both for your reviews. And uh, anything else you'd like to add before we uh, move on? <sighs> wow. <laughs> Appreciate that, Sam. Uh, oh, wait. This may be the last time you see me before Selfie starts airing. Oh. So the debut's Tuesday, September 30th. Days, thank you very ABC. much. On the ABC. On the ABC at 8 p.m. Watch that. I'm in four of the first six. I won't tell you which. You'll have to tune in every week. <laughs> but it's a funny show, and I think I think you'll like it. Uh-huh. And I don't mean you. No, no. I mean you. <laughs> you mean the world at large. Yeah. Sure. Most, I'm mostly talking to my family right now. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Yeah, they are predisposed to kind of like it. Um, that's it? That's it. That's okay. all I got. Um, I want to thank the folks uh, here at the Westwood One Studios for having us for these three shows. We're um, excited about the upcoming shows before we start today's. We, um, One of my favorite uh, cinema pot-smoking moms in the history of cinema, she of uh, the pot-smoking mom in Poltergeist, Joe Beth Williams uh, will be our guest next Sunday. We're going to pre-tape that on Wednesday. Uh, full disclosure. Then we're going to take a few weeks off for some weddings and some movies. A movie I have to do. Gun to my head. Uh, and then come back in new studio digs, which will be announced soon. <clears throat> um, with two back-to-back amazing shows, we got your Johnny Galecki. Followed by Shawl. Is it Shawl? Yep. Yep. Kristen. I always feel the need to mispronounce because there's a double A. Like I should be saying, Kristen Shell. Nope. No, you got it right the first time. Shawl. Kristen Shawl. Where's the W? 
Let's remove the second A so I can say shawl. I think this is how you should start the interview. <laughs> I'm, I'm rehearsing some of this. Okay. Is that a problem? None whatsoever. I'd like to be prepared. I understand. I like her very much. I find her comedy to be uh, soothing and hilarious. Uh-huh. Her character Louise on Bob's Burgers. Jamie and I maybe say, uh, where do you shop? Or sh I need a receipt. Where do you even shop? Yeah. You know, I'm sure all the people who tuned in for our guests today are happy to join you for the rehearsal that you're having for the Kristen Shawl episode. Uh, you think that's... I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're very pleased. Well, then I won't stop. Because I was about to stop. But it seems like you're encouraging no, me stop. to continue. Please continue. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. I think that's it. Oh, we're looking for uh, some sponsor partners. You know, the folks write to us at contact at KevinPollockShotShow.com often and say, how can we help? Um, and the community, through Twitter and social media, is how the show was initially launched five and a half years ago. There was no announcement anywhere but Twitter, in fact, that the first episode was going to air. And within six episodes, we were on the cover of the Los Angeles Times newspaper because people used to read paper. Um, and the, the community that's been supportive of this show and all podcasts is, uh, is a voice that is sort of taking over all media that I'm awfully damn excited about, uh, excited that we jumped into the space five and a half years ago ahead of most, um, and have been, uh, enjoying all of your support, uh, these many years. If there are business owners out there who want to become a business partner with this show, Write to us at contact at KevinPollockChatShow.com. We are, we are interested in taking on some new partners in our new endeavor as we move forward. So I felt uh, here was a chance to reach our community, our followers, our listeners, our viewers, and say, you want to get involved? Uh, there's a window of opportunity, and it's going to close pretty fast. So make sure you know which side of that. <laughs> I'm what? What happened? It seemed like I fell asleep right in the middle of the... I can't remember a time when you weren't talking. Pitch! <laughs> uh, that's why we love him. That's why we don't pay him. My guest today um, hails from the great state of Virginia. I'm going to let him tell you the rest of his story. Please welcome Kristen Shale. <laughs> Shawl? Wow. Is it Shawl? It's still Shawl. Sha I believe she pronounces it. Shawl. Say Craig both A's. Kakowski. Thank um, you. Thanks for being cool with the uh, spelling and pronunciation of my name. Yeah, yeah. I like Kakowski. It's fun to say. It is. A lot of hard K sounds yeah. in there. Comedy, Comedy K's. K's. Yeah. Comedy K's. I'm loaded with them. You need one more to be uh, a hooded racist. That's right. They had my parents spelled Craig with a K. We'd be home free. <laughs> We'd be home free. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm honored to be the second uh, of three episodes of Westwood <laughs> One. <laughs> As we all know, the second of the trilogy is always the best. Yeah, well, that's we do know the, that. That's following the Empire Strikes Back rule, of course, not the Temple of Doom rule. No, no, no. Or the Godfather? Poltergeist rule. <laughs> <laughs> Godfather and Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. yeah. True to that rule. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite movie this summer? Uh, Boyhood. Because? Easy answer. Uh, it was three hours long. Sure. <laughs> <It's the laughs> Next most, question. <laughs> the most moving means it's the best. Sure. Uh, no, I found it profoundly moving. Hmm. Uh, and for people who are daunted by the length, I would say they shot it over 12 years. So it's basically like 12 15-minute shorts back to back. Sure. Uh, did you see it? I did not. Uh, but purposely. <laughs> yeah, I made a, a conscious decision. Yes, to avoid it. Yes, because of the. So hype? That's why I'd like to know more. Overhyped for you? Uh, I don't think they did a particularly good job, for my taste, mm -hmm. of drawing my interest. Okay. The premise of we took twelve years to shoot this so yeah. that we could actually see uh, the evolution of a child through uh, actual years was not enough. Yeah, to me it overcame the gimmick. You know, the gimmick is maybe to get people in there. Uh, but the shots, uh, the jump cuts from one year to the next and just seeing the kid a year older feel almost like the 2001 bone to uh, spaceship jump Sh cut for me. Yeah, oh really? <laughs> uh, in terms of how effective they are. Oh wow. Uh, and it just, it reminded me a lot of just growing up and it's just, it's small, human moments is all it is there's right. no big plot points in it really 
Patricia Arquette is great in it. She's kind of the lead character in a way because it's kind of done through the mom's eyes, uh, I think. But uh, so you never it, see her face. You never see her face. <laughs> right. right. The whole movie. Just her POV. It's the way I prefer to see Patricia Arquette. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's so funny because we have her online too, Patricia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're old friends. Yeah. <laughs> she, she'll be cool about yeah. it, I'm sure. But hopefully that'll make you overcome your knee-jerk prejudice. <laughs> no, the truth is the gimmick, as you were kind enough to call it, yeah. being a fan of the movie. <laughs> um, I'm sure uh, was Rich all Linklater they, is very happy about that as but well. It, but it's all they promoted, <laughs> yeah. quite frankly, that I saw. Yeah. And for my taste, it was uh, not a draw. It was... Um, I don't know. It, it it left me sort of cold, like, oh, so okay, you are clever. I mean, I I I'd, I'd rather have some emotional attachment to some of the characters, yeah. Even though you only have thirty seconds to get that across, what you've done is you've tried to impress me with the filmmaker's notion of right. a new way to shoot a film, and. <laughs> 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 um, uh, one of my favorite movies of any summer. That you were in uh, would be the kings of the summer. kings of summer. Ah, yeah. Yes. yes, I'm nearly subliminal <laughs> <laughs> in that, but yes. But by the way, I, one of the things I liked about it. Yes, <laughs> that's just, why I brought it just up. Just the right amount of Kikowski yeah. in it. Uh, I'm in the trailer. Sure. And a lot of people again would... the all important trailer. Yes. How do you get people to see the film? You got to give me a little Kukowski. Promise that Kukowski will be in it for five seconds, well, and he was. I don't know that that promise was in the trailer. <laughs> The trailer was that you were in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and in it, and uh, it is a great movie. And uh, I actually did the improv coaching for the three lead kids. I worked with them for a month before they started shooting. Uh, the director was a buddy of mine, Jordan Vote roberts mm -hmm. And uh, Does he need all three names? I believe he does. They're hyphenated. At least two of them are hyphenated. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure oh, where the... That is correct. I'm not sure where the hyphen falls. All three. I don't know that it matters. <laughs> uh, but he just wanted the kids to kind of loosen up in front of the camera and to be able to go beyond uh, cut right? and for them just to be uh, natural. So so he thought he would get one of the, arguably, at least according to the street, mm. one of the best improv teachers in Los Angeles. And one, when of I say breast, <laughs> one of the breasts. One of the I think you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Known for your rack. Yes. <laughs> um, I hear that a lot. Yeah, Thank no. Uh, a lot of the research that we've done suggests, uh, with some quotes. Okay. That you are now considered to be one of the best improv teachers in the city of Los Angeles, mm. and um, there there are at last count five hundred and seventeen. I want to poo poo that. I'm not limiting this to Los Angeles. Keep, I'm keep talking, this. California I'm this to all of all of North and South America. Wow, can't give there's you Europe. Some Uruguayan teachers. <laughs> I can't give you Europe, but okay. you've got the entire Western Hemisphere. Well, I've been doing it for a while. I've been teaching improv for about 20 years, so it's kind of the uh, the old soldiers and uh, hookers uh, thing. Keep talking. That they get respectable uh, after a while. Right. Uh, which I believe is a quote from... Churchill. Churchill. Yeah. <laughs> Winston mm -hmm. Churchill said that. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, I've been you mentioned Kristen Shaw, or Shaal. Uh -huh. uh, she was a student of mine. Uh, Jordan Peele, who you had recently, another yes. former student of mine. Both of those guys, when they were around 18... Uh, you like to get them young. I, I get that's them young. what the research that's when says. That's they're moldable. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's not what the research says. It did not mention moldable. <laughs> um, something about orifices yeah. was in the research. <laughs> I tried to have that suppressed, but that's, <laughs> if it's he, out there, it's out there. He just there. means your comedy hole. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, right, right. What, comedy hole. Yeah, what else could, yeah. could I have? Put something in that comedy hole early. Yeah, there it is. I was told I would not have to do the blowjob jokes that Sam <laughs> had to it's do because my parents are probably also watching. <laughs> I have a, right I have now. a question, sir. Uh, you attained some of your higher learning mm -hmm. at the College of William and Mary. Yeah, Bill and Mary. Yeah, my question: uh, Who exactly was this Mary Broad? Mary was maybe the Queen of England. <laughs> 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 maybe? I think she was. Okay. Yeah. I think I think he was William of Orange. Uh huh. Maybe. And Mary of uh, England. Mary of England. Sure. When William of Orange and Mary of England married, mm -hmm. uh, they became the union of William and Mary, and a college was dubbed thusly. William and Mary is the second oldest college in the nation after Harvard. I believe Harvard was. Uh, Open its doors first. William and Mary was chartered first. Chartered? Chartered. Uh, like rented? 
we didn't do it. <laughs> yes. But there was a deal with the lease, and uh-huh. somehow Harvard was just able to get in there a right. little earlier. Uh, but yeah, it's it's in Colonial Williamsburg, very near the glass blowers and the settle uh, down, <laughs> the butter churners. Yeah, now, and, now uh, you're only selling. You it. would expect there. Yeah, you're selling it far too good now. That's where I went to school. Um, Majored in theater. Um, I've yes. been to Colonial Williamsburg mm-hmm. as a child, and so I'm now imagining that your university uh, took place in the Colonial Williamsburg setting. With, with sure, with, with tights and with tights yeah, and everything, appropriate garb, right? And, and so you had to show up in class, and if you brought like a notebook and a and a pen, they'd be like, "What is this? No, here is your you got to have a quill, your, quill pen. your your yes. cold pencil, and the 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 back of a of an old lady to write on. I don't know how they did yes. it back then. To ask desks. a question, the teacher would say, "Governor." <laughs> I think they had individual blackboards. Yep. That sure, about right. slates. Yeah, slates. Sure, we so wrote on slates. That's how you went to, yes. uh, that's where your higher learning that's was? where all my theater classes were exactly like that. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I'm very impressed. I didn't mean to open such a large door to the mocking of <laughs> William and Mary. I apologize with my silly No, that's question. fine. It deserves it. <laughs> that's the second oldest <laughs> teaching institution in the nation. Yeah. Um, you had yourself a time there, but then soon after it was off to Chicago, or Chi-Town, sure. if you will. That's what we call it. Where you studied. Study big shoulders. Right. The Windy City, yeah. known for the wind of the politicians. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And the big shoulders from the Super Bowl shuffle? Sure. <laughs> Michigan. Yes. Jimbo Michigan. Coberts. Michigan. Uh, is that his name? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Wrong sport for me. <laughs> um, so much has been written about you studying with Del Close, but I, and you've been forced often, I'm sure, to talk about it. Um, so I want to see if we can get to, if it's possible, some new ground um, for those uh, not as fortunate to have had what is becoming a singular window of opportunity to study with basically one of the Yodas yeah. of, of the art form. Um, so let me see if, if I can get into some s- specifics. Um, in terms of what it meant to you? Well, that window closed 15 years ago, by the way, with Dell's death. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's when it ended. Yeah. Um, but I got in there in 92 is when I moved to Chicago. Uh, at the time, I, didn't, I was not aware of Dell. Uh, I was not aware of the Improv Olympic, where I ended up studying, now the I.O. You went to study drama. I, I was a theater major. I did a lot of serious plays. Yeah. Uh, I actually I did join the college improv troupe, but when I left, I was thinking, I'll go to Chicago and like do some serious acting. Start taking know? this shit seriously. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be Joe Montaigne. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice yeah. pull for 92. Sure. Do, uh, do some mammoth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Is that what you were going to do? Some mammoth? <laughs> some mammoth, I'm asking if you were going to do? Some mammoth? Yeah. You're saying the... With the... <laughs> you're... Fuck you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for playing. Uh, yes. A play in my one first second. attempt at Mammoth. Um, <laughs> but I ended up uh, kind of falling in with the improv crowd. And uh, and Dell was the teacher at the time. And I only had two teachers. I had Sharna Halpern, who owns the place, still runs it to this day. And uh, Dell, who was kind of the, the mad uh, genius of comedy, you know, Rasputin-like fellow with a thick beard. Uh he had quit smoking, so he would have a, uh, a rubber band around his arm that he would pull back and snap to, uh, to stop the uh, inclination to, uh, to smoke. And maybe intimidate some of the students that he could take that Absolutely. sort of pain? Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his veins were all shot. He would show us his, uh, his veins that he could no longer shoot up in. Uh, Speak of the golden days of heroin? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. And... Anyone from that era plays the Del Close game, similar to a game that you might employ on your show. Really? <laughs> in that there, there's just things that you plug into. Because uh, Dell had met everyone and worked with everyone in show business. He'd also done every drug. So the Del Close game would be to uh, put an obscure celebrity in with a drug and uh, a location. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, Dell got kind of a deep... Uh, resonant voice with a kind of a scratchiness to it, so the stories would be like, ah, I was uh, doing a, a blow with Willie Tyler and Lester uh, <laughs> in a, a cheap motel outside of uh, Helena, Montana. 
Uh, <laughs> and so the uh, the first hour of class would basically just be Dell lecturing, and I would just be you know I was a you know hot gun you know willing to just scrappy. I, wanted, I was scrappy. I just wanted to get on stage, do the work, be funny. Not listen necessarily not to listen. hour of yeah, and uh, I would start just kind of like sneaking up onto stage. Uh, and I think he kind of like respected the balls of that because he'd be like, oh, well, I guess we're uh, getting started. Uh, <laughs> that was so his cue would... because one of his students, in this case, <laughs> you, like, yeah, I guess had wandered start onto now. the stage. Uh, but his lecture would actually have some purpose to it. And they he was trying to get us to think about the big ideas behind improv. Uh, I mean, he, he came from the stand up world. He came from the beatnik world mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but he was very much trying to get us to not try to be funny. You know, trust that comedy is a byproduct of doing improv right. If you do improv right, it will often result in, in comedy. Laughs. But you just have to trust that. Uh, if you go for laughs, you're going to swing and miss more than you connect. Yeah. And you're going to fuck the, uh, the long-term prospects of the scene for a, a, a cheap joke in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, So it was about building sustainability with your partner or partners and uh and he was big on the big themes too you know you'd finish a piece and he'd be like well you know a lot of uh, expressionistic tendencies there and it just got me thinking about you know just what's going on politically now I'm like oh great if that's what you took away from it. <laughs> yeah like we, we weren't doing anything like that but he would he would always kind of read deeper meaning into what we were doing which kind of at least makes you think about the art of it, or at least that it's beyond what you're doing. That you know people are going to interpret it however they want to, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but but he, pushing the art as well as the humor. Yeah, he was big on the art of uh, of improv. So I, I studied with him for a couple years, and then uh, eventually I started teaching there, and he would teach downstairs while I taught upstairs. And it was honored just to be in the same building as the guy. I was teaching in a theater named for him, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he passed away in '99. Uh, and uh, just a big loss for the comedy and specifically the improv community. But uh, for those of us who studied with him, you know, any opportunity to talk about him, we always will take advantage of that. Right. Uh, well, and they've got the the Del Close Marathon every year. Yeah, UCB in New York does the Del Close Marathon, which is seventy two hours of uh, improv. It's insane. Yeah, it I'm going to say Friday. that's too much. <laughs> it's seventy two. You're not obligated to watch the whole thing, but oh, but some, yeah. I misunderstood. You can come and go as you like as an audience member. Because the Labor Day Jerry Lewis telethon <laughs> was something that I felt the need to watch thirty six hours straight. Yeah. You just wanted to watch it that long to see how how batshit crazy Jerry would get by the end. Well, let's put it this way. If if once a year you're not willing to hear, give me a Tiffany, <laughs> then I don't think you're committed at all to, uh, to comedy and or giving. <laughs> um, let me ask you this then. So when you taught those three uh, kids in the Kings of Summer. Sure. Um, what I'm assuming they were quite new to the teachings of improv. Uh, I'm assuming, correct me, please, uh, if you feel the need or place. Uh, so as new, fresh blood to to the teachings, not just the doing, uh, is there a um, s specific style that you put forward based on the fact they were younger, or do you pretty much treat everyone the same? I kind of treated everyone the same. My wife teaches kids and teens in improv a lot, and I would not want to do that. Uh. <laughs> Frequently, not a fan. Not a fan of teenagers, right? <laughs> in general, but uh -huh. well, these guys were working actors. Like they, uh, they have way more credits than I do. You know, like <laughs> did you keep that in mind <laughs> when you were teaching <laughs> yeah. them? So they're all you know, fifteen to eighteen, but they work a lot. Yeah, uh, and they were already pretty comfortable in their own skin, which a lot of teaching class is just try to get people to be the best possible versions of themselves and not feel that they have to try to give the audience what they want or try to give the teacher what they want. I don't know what the fuck I want, mm. you know, yeah. other than people who are comfortable right. doing their thing, yeah. whatever that is. So these guys were already pretty comfortable. I think it was just a case of building them as an ensemble of uh, just doing exercises to help them get to know each other and uh, to help them start to think about their characters in the movie and start to think about, 
you know, what, what would my guy say that's off the page? Right. It's not on the page, but, you know, put your characters in this situation or this location, pair them off in different combinations, and what do they say to each other? Uh, and for them not to feel that they had to do the writing uh, or that they had to deliver jokes, they just had to be those guys, and the humor is going to come from those guys being those guys. Yeah, well, to that uh, point, um, I liked a couple of the things that I've uh, quotes like the character doesn't have to know everything that the writer knows. This is a Kikowski that's a, that's pure quote. Kikowski. Yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds like me. Yeah, I. Yeah, improv is kind of a combination of your inner actor combi uh, combining with your inner writer. And, it, you know, there's a real push-pull there. There's so many things you have to kind of get in perfect balance, yin-yang-wise, with improv. And people come up from, from a acting perspective, like, they've got stage presence, they're interesting to watch, they have energy, and a lot of times they don't know what the fuck is going on in their own scene. Mm -hmm. You know, but they're interesting to watch. And there are people coming at it from a writing perspective of like, they've got ideas, they've got premises, they're verbose, uh, but they can't produce an authentic emotion or listen well to the other person. Right. Uh, so you want to kind of get those things in perfect balance. And so while improvising a scene, it's kind of like, hey, my actor's doing this. Uh, I better write him some dialogue that kind of justifies why he's behaving this way. Or, uh, hey, my writer wrote me this line. How do I feel about that? Yeah. Uh, so you're kind of doing that while improvising. But uh, improvisers have a tendency uh, to wink at the audience a lot, and the character knows everything that the writer does. Uh, so then you start kind of commenting on what's going on. You try to start problem solving, which leads to like negotiation scenes, which are not interesting. Uh, trying to fix a problem in comedy, we're in the problem heightening business, yeah, not the problem solving business. So, if it's you know, add conflict, add conflict. Uh, if it's uh, about a cheating husband, then the game of that scene is just how much of a dirt bag is this guy, and how many ways can we show that. The second you you fall into of like, well, let's work out a relationship, and what if we did this, and we could do this. Whenever you hear what if or maybe or we could, you're talking about another scene, mm -hmm. sometime in the future, as opposed to what's going on right now in the present, which is how much comedy juice can we wring out of this one particular situation that's going on now. Right. And so th that leads to uh, to heightening. Just do more of. <laughs> what you're already doing rather than trying to fix it. Right. Uh, but the writer wants to fix it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love to improvise. Um, I have been told recently that my specialty, as opposed to yes and, is yes period. <laughs> <laughs> it just ends there. Yeah. Yep. I'll do the button. You, yeah. you throw it to me whenever you'd like the scene to end. <laughs> you handle your own edits. That's very nice. Did someone really tell you who told you that? You I was fucking up? around with somebody recently, and they said, you're really doing more of a yes, period. <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's Been a, there. Yeah, it's exactly right. Uh, what I also found interesting, one of your first teachers um, – was Matt Besser, one of, one of the founding partners of UCB. Yeah. Uh, he was on a team called The Family mm. at uh, Improv Olympic when I started there, which was all legendary guys. This it was is Besser, Chicago, of course. Yeah, in Chicago. Besser, Ian Roberts, one of the other founders of UCB, Miles Stroth, Ali Faranakian, Neil Flynn from The Middle, mm -hmm. uh, and Adam McKay of Anchorman and sure. other great comedies. And so Adam uh, McKay and Ian Roberts were my very first improv coaches. And then Besser was my coach for about two years right. after that. And he did not suffer fools. Does not. No. Ma Matt and, Besser. And he was also very much in the Dell tradition of, like, he had no problem ripping you a new one. Uh, all those guys were very tough on me. Did you take some of that into your own style of teaching? No, I'm a lot more nurturing. Are you? I'd like to think so. Um, because it's your nature or because you I think, think it's it just works who I, better? I think it's who I am. Um it works better in LA, I think. You know, there is something. Because people have thinner skin. People have thinner skin. Right. Uh, Every winners aren't as harsh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago, you're just tough. You know, you got to be yeah. to survive uh, that cold. Um, but I think also it, at the time I was in Chicago, like there was no 
notion that this would get you anywhere. Right. <laughs> right. Like none of us were making anything close to a living at it. Sure. Uh, even Second City, which is a big game in town where people would go to make money, there was no hope of any Second City people being hired at I.O. In addition to those guys that I mentioned, like Tina Fey was there at the time. Mm-hmm. Amy Poehler, John Glazer, uh, Rich Fulcher, you know, Horatio Sands, like all these incredible people <laughs> performing upstairs at a shitty bar to no one. <laughs> And the only reason we were doing it because we just wanted to get better at it and we loved it. Right. Um, so there was something about those guys kind of setting the bar high for me at a time where there was no prospects that this was going to be a career right. in any way. It meant we were really just, again, kind of pursuing the art of it. And I don't want to get too precious about it. I mean, because we were working on comedy, too. Like, we wanted to be funny. Well, yeah. But we wanted to be funny in a, in a particular way. So I, I think... The standard that those guys set for me have, has stayed the same of the standard that I hold my students to. Uh, but I also, at this point, I kind of know all the neuroses that go into trying to do uh, right. this challenging work. And I, I try to be a little more supportive <laughs> about that, I think. Yeah. Um, i like to jump around a little bit on the show. so Absolutely. So brace yourself. All right. Let's do a behind the music if we could, sure. I want you to uh, be the voiceover guy and walk us through a brief history in the behind the music way for... Or behind the laughter. Yeah. <laughs> That's the Simpsons version. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically for dance music for Italian rabbis. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you have a crack research team. That's yeah, your very own Jason McIntyre. <laughs> You can thank him in class. Sure. Put him through a few extra paces (laughs) for his fine work. In 1985, two awkward, acne-stained teenagers named Craig Kukowski and Toby Ramsey (laughs) released an album to no one entitled (laughs) Dance Music for Italian Rabbis, entirely consisting of songs that Toby and Craig had written on a pre-programmed Casio keyboard. (laughs) With three beats, <laughs> which were <laughs> uh, that was one of the beats that went to it. But I, uh, uh, I think this was kind of uh, Toby was my best friend growing up, sure, and uh, lived down the block from me. No and question about it. A guy who was way more talented than I, kind of a Renaissance man. He could play any instrument. Great sense of humor. We did puppet shows when we were eight years old. Of course you, know, you did. Uh, the, <laughs> the Muppets were a big influence on me. Uh-huh. And uh, I think this was kind of like our Weird Al phase. <laughs> uh, we didn't do parody songs. Actually, we did a couple. Everyone does uh, at some oh, point, I think. Um, it's inevitable. But uh, this was us just doing silly songs that we made up. Uh, I Like Slugs was one. Mm-hmm. I took a trip to Africa. It makes me barf. It the flying yak of Romania. <laughs> Does any of this ring a bell? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. We're not uh, fucking around here, buddy. Yeah. The There's no way to find <laughs> any of these songs. Oh, that's luckily. where you're wrong. The deluxe reissue is available on Amazon right now. Okay. Jay, man, give us just a few bars of uh, the flying yak of Romania, please. Nope. Oh, this <laughs> me? Nope. Oh, J-Mac has it. No, no, you. We're looking for you to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't even remember gone. how it went. It's no, gone to the it's ether? Gone. It's gone in the ether. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, now you see why he's a three-time winner of the Dell Close Award for Excellence in Teaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, Those who won. can't do. He doesn't have to have any. He's not won a single award for remembering things. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't know his remembering names. The, the shitty, embarrassing things I did when <laughs> I was hey, 15. Hey, Sam, when I want you to bail out the guest, I'll give you a signal. <laughs> I was trying to. Yeah. You know, He's going to touch I... his belt buckle not once, not twice, <laughs> not thrice. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling the country and abroad, uh, that's not two words, mm-hmm. <laughs> with the Second City National Touring Company. I'm quite curious about this. This seems like a life experience that must have been pretty spectacular. Both yeah. highs and lows. Yeah, uh, I, I toured for three years with Second City. This is what you do when you work your way through their system there. You start as an understudy to the touring company. then And literally, I was lucky enough to... Uh, I was hired at the same time as Rich Fulcher, uh, who's bigger in England than he is here, but he's a comedy legend as far as I'm concerned. He's, uh, he's on the show The Mighty Boosh. 
uh -huh. uh, in England and many other great BBC sketch shows. He's an American dude. We were hired at the same time, uh, and you were expected to like go to rehearsals uh, and just kind of like follow people uh, to in case you had to go in for them. And uh, we went to uh, tour co rehearsal, and Kevin Dorf was one of the guys at the time, one of my idols. And, uh, and he was gonna miss a show. And we literally flipped a coin to see whether me or Rich would go in. I ended up going in, so I ended up kind of being Kevin's understudy. Uh, and that eventually I took his place in mm. that company. So of like sometimes it could be just the flip of a coin uh, in terms of what gives you an opportunity. That's the difference between Sam and I where we sit right now. Really? As a matter of fact. Yeah, that's <laughs> how this whole thing one. started. Is yeah. it the yeah. Sam Levine chat show? <laughs> or the exactly Kevin right. chat right. show? Yeah, I had created it and I thought, you know what? That's not fair. Yeah. Why not give Sam an equal shot at this? So, yeah, we flipped a coin ten times. He said if nine of them were heads, I could host. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I fair. I get, if nothing. <laughs> I get another shot in 2017. <laughs> but touring was basically just being... <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I grow bored of this bit. Um, <laughs> now, now I know what Del Close felt like right. when you walked up on stage during uh, one of his blowhard speeches. There's only so much material you can do off of coin flipping. <laughs> <laughs> As I learned when I was in Omaha with uh, Diane Cannon. Uh, <laughs> doing crystal meth. Um, Speaking of cannons, <laughs> you were saying... Uh, so you it, went on the it, tour? Yeah, it's it was basically just being in a shitty rental van, driving yeah. around mostly Midwestern states. Mm -hmm. A lot of Iowa. Was there sex on the tour? Uh, in, that it included me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there was not. Uh, <laughs> but there, I'm told that lots of people were getting laid. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, you also sailed the high seas as a Second City cast member on the Norwegian Gem? Yes. Um, one of the more I have to ask. One of the more prestigious cruise Was ships. there sex on the open seas? Uh, absolutely was. Uh, however, I was <laughs> my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, yes. uh, was the person I was touring with. So uh -huh. that's mostly who I was having sex with. Mostly? Yes. I think it's an important <laughs> line to draw. Yes. As you know, according to the rule of the seas, the captain may invite you to his cabin. <laughs> at any point, Where that's where the phrase, hey, anything goes in international waters, yes. comes from. A plot point that was often exploited on the love boat, <laughs> Kevin McLeod. Yeah, uh, yeah, we we uh, we did that for four months. That was great because it was uh, it was during the writers' strike here, so there was nothing going on. Didn't feel like I was missing anything. Mm -hmm. I was with my girlfriend, and we were out of uh, Barcelona. I'll say. Yeah, we were in Barcelona most of the time. That was our home port, and uh, we hit a lot of the Mediterranean ports. And the, the good thing about it for me was I had already finished Second City at that point. I'd toured, I'd done five shows uh, on their stages in Chicago. Like I was not working my way up through their ladder. This was me, them throwing me a bone of like, hey, you wanna come to this cruise ship for four months? Absolutely. Yeah. I got nothing else going on. Sure. Uh, other people in the cast were, you know, getting started within the Second City system. So like they wanted to rehearse all the time. Right. Of like, let's polish some of these bits. I'm like, dude, <sighs> I'm on vacation in Europe. Yeah, there's something called the Lido girlfriend. deck and yes. I need to find it. Yeah. yeah. And we were doing like best of Second City material that I had done before. Uh, so, but on a 13 day cruise uh, through the Mediterranean, stopping in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Nice, uh, et cetera, we would have to work two days out of that 13. Mm. One day doing two half hour improv shows, one day doing two 45 minute sketch shows. So that's the extent that I How do you survive I, that, that kind of workload? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough, Kevin. Let me sure. tell you. Yeah. F favorite city out there off the open seas? Uh, I did like Barcelona quite a bit, and, I, and I, I do like saying it that way as well. And why is that? Uh, because of the lift. Is it the affectation? <laughs> it's the that affectation. You enjoy? Yeah. Right. I just want everyone to know how m proficient I am in Castilian Spanish. And where do you fall on the legend or myth as to how it got started? Barcelona? Yeah. The, well, the, the, the pronunciation. I'm, I'm not familiar with the legend or myth. Well, if you go online and search it a bit, okay, because I'd been told by far too many seemingly knowledgeable people that it was either the king of Spain or some person of incredible import um, had this lisp. Mm -hmm. And so as a way to not offend, everyone else started speaking <laughs> with a similar lisp. And eventually the entire uh, city of Barcelona yeah. spoke that way. That's, that's probably apocryphal, but uh -huh. uh, I love it. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I would totally buy into that. Another great city, Lisbon. 
I enjoyed everywhere uh, in Portugal that I went. Lisbon. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lisbon. <laughs> <laughs> We're Lisbon and Lisbon. Um. Oh, so, so uh, here's another thing I want to ask about. Um. Well, first of all, it was Bar- Barcelona and Lisbon were two of your favorite Love those cities. cities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the country of Italy uh, is still my favorite in terms of. Um, they're doing it right. Oh those guys. They're not. Yeah. Th- uh, yeah. Just they know what they know what they're doing with the pizza. Extraordinarily uh, uh, happy people, who um, work to live, not live to work, like we do here. Sure. You know. Um, I like the vacation mentality in Europe. It's just well. this giant vacation in the middle of the day. Yes. For 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 Italy is pretty spectacular. Um, I want to talk also about. Uh, you mentioned your friend working in the UK. You've now worked there, um, at very least on this ABC TV show. Trust with trust us with your life. Trust us with your life. A short-lived series. Sure. On the American Broadcasting Corporation. I. Uh, but uh, that was done by Dan Patterson, the creator of Whose Line Is It Anyway? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and had some of the, uh, the notable improvisers from that, Wayne Brady, Colin Mockery, right. Jonathan Mangum, uh, Greg Proops uh, also did it, Brad Sherwood, fantastic guys and fantastic improvisers. And I come from more of a long form mentality, uh, which means that when Whose Line was first on, we would have kind of disdain for that of like, oh, they're just playing these games or whatever. When I actually had to do that stuff with those guys, <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm, I'm an improviser, like I'm pretty proud of my, my chops. I could not hang with those guys in terms of what they were doing, in terms of... Well, it's a specialty that, yes. that becomes, you become proficient when that's the majority of what you're doing. Yeah. I think they just had a little more experience on you. There are people who can play flamenco guitar and metal guitar, and there's people who are just like, hey, I just do flamenco, dude. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but it, it was a great learning experience to like to see Wayne Brady like improvise 40 songs in a row in 40 different genres with rhyming couplets and harmonies. And yeah. <laughs> of like, that dude knows what he's doing. But yeah, we shot eight episodes uh, at the BBC in the UK. Uh, for me, it's just like, Hey, flying first class to London, staying at a five star hotel. Living and you know. working in the United Kingdom. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I had a great two weeks. Uh they ended up using me in two episodes, both of which aired. Uh the series was pulled a little early. Uh uh Fred Willard got in a, <laughs> got in a little trouble while the show was airing. Oh. I don't know. I don't know if that was a factor. Fred was the host. Did that and uh, I know Fred was the, the host from the research, but did that I didn't I don't know if that was a factor or the fact that we were the lowest rated show in the history of summer. I'm going to uh, say that maybe take the heat <laughs> off of Fred. Yes. Craig? Yes. If you wouldn't mind. Uh but I do want to know what it was like impersonating Ozzy Osbourne for the very first time in your life live on TV and wait for it in front of his children Jack and Kelly. Yeah, it was nerve wracking, and uh, you know those those games. They you kind of know what game you're going to play. You don't know what the suggestions are going to be because they need to kind of set a running order. And I, I don't even remember what game we were playing specifically. But uh, but Fred would then tell you what character you're going to be. Uh, I had never done an Aussie or prepared an Aussie, right? Uh, and so then I had to to improvise him right in front of uh, Jack and Kelly. Uh, they Hugged me after the show. They seemed okay with it. <laughs> it got some laughs. I, it was also, I think, the very first thing I did. So I was just pissing my pants, nervous. Sure. Uh, but I, I think there's something about kind of using that adrenaline, which helps. Uh, like adrenaline, uh, like if I don't get scared before a show, uh, I'm worried. You know, <laughs> like you should be a little scared yeah. for an improv show. Um, like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Why wouldn't that be scary? Yeah. Uh, but you can tap into that fear and use it in the form of adrenaline. Like, adrenaline is there, like, physi- physiologically from when we, were, when we were, like, running from mammoths. Yes. You know? So, if, like, it makes our eyes wider, our ears wider, so you're more attuned mm-hmm. to what's going on uh, sensory-wise yeah. around you. Pumps blood to your extremities. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, all I'll, of that can be used. Yeah, I, I've done stand-up comedy uh, since a very early age, and and professionally for more than three decades and to this day people still ask what seems to me like a painfully obvious pedestrian question 
Uh, do you still get nervous when you go up there? And um, I I don't ever remember being nervous. I remember being excited. Hmm. Even my first time walking out on The Tonight Show to sit next to Johnny Carson to make him laugh, to me, in my mind at that time, the ultimate judge um, and most important to impress, I just remember feeling excited like it was the first time I was going to Disneyland mm. as opposed to what if this doesn't go well. Yeah. Th that's just not in my being, but I don't know how specific that is. To I think uh, what I'm saying, what I'm describing is closer to what you're, you're saying, I think. Excited might be a better way of phrasing it, but, well, you know, it, it shouldn't be self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've got to assume that I've done the training, you know, I know who I am. I know what I do. I'm just going to do the thing that I do. Right. Uh, and I know that I'm good at it. And if people enjoy it, then they'll enjoy it. If they don't, they don't. But you are facing, or one is facing, who chooses to improvise live on stage. Uh, the ultimate uh, challenge, which is that the audience might know the following. Watching bad improv is maybe the worst thing in, in life. <laughs> <laughs> So you probably, when you teach improv, you, I don't know if that comes up much. <laughs> I personally believe that bad sketch is worse. Yeah. And for this reason, when you see a bad sketch, you're like, oh, you, you meant for it to go this way. <laughs> you, you actually, you wrote it this way. You, you directed it this way. You rehearsed you rocked it. it this way. You rehearsed it. You want it to be this. Yeah. yeah. At least, yeah, and this is mostly from my role as like an improv teacher or coach. At least when it's bad, I can laugh sadistically <laughs> <laughs> at it. You know, right. I, I, I take some pleasure in watching them struggle. You know, uh, I, I don't take pleasure in struggling myself when I do it. But yeah, bad, bad improv is, is painful. Yeah, I think bad sketch even more so. But I think I mean bad stand up is sure. wildly painful. <laughs> um, one of the great Chicago actors, William H Macy, uh, spoke to this very point in my soon-to-be award-winning film <laughs> documentary, Misery Loves Comedy. Um, I say soon-to-be because it hasn't played yet. Um, that watching a stand-up bombing for him as an actor is the single most painful experience of his mm. life. Um, I'm assuming he's never seen one of his children die. I'm assuming. I might be wrong. <laughs> but in terms of him I hope that's the case. Yes. <laughs> pinpointing <laughs> this is the single most painful agonizing thing but he was really relating it more truthfully uh as a performer watching another performer suffer in that way yeah it's just too agonizing for him and for him personally he needs to get up and leave the theater <laughs> he c can't physically withstand that sort of pain yeah stand-ups for me uh i get uncomfortable when they when they're bombing, but there's too much reference to what they expect to be getting, you know, in terms of like, hey, come on, guys, this is it's killed the I mean, earlier show. Yeah. yeah, what's your problem? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I respect the guys who would just kind of stick to their guns of just like, hey, this, this is my thing. It's right. not working for you, but I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Yeah. Uh, but when you expect this amount of laugh for each thing, and you get angry at the audience for not doing it, you know, yeah, then it's just kind of furthering that adversarial relationship yeah. uh, which is not going to win the no over. yeah um uh the british comic rob bryden who you might know from the uh, sure the trip trip to italy is the latest one he spoke about a, a method to deal with bombing which was now he just slows down and looks like he's having fun <laughs> and then the audience goes, I thought he was bombing, but clearly it's me. Right. Look how much fun this guy's having, <laughs> which I thought was kind of diabolical. Well, audiences are like predators. They smell fear. So, you know, OK to be nervous, but you can't show it to them. Yeah. You know, so you got to find some shell of protection. Right. Uh, and particularly for improv, you know, fun is most of the battle. Right. You know. Uh, if you do the things that are fun and interesting for you, you hope that they'll be fun and interesting for the audience. But, you know, I deal with students a lot of times and they'll 
again, they, they'll go for like, oh, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do, or I guess this is what the audience wants, or I, I guess this will be funny. If like, well, if you don't think it's funny, right? <laughs> I'm not going to think it's funny. If you don't think it's interesting, I'm not going to think it's interesting. So like, stick to things that are fun and interesting for you. Yeah, it, but that the word here may be uh, most helpful may be commitment because yeah. whether it's stand up sketch or improv, the best way to not show fear is to commit so much. To what you're doing. Don't apologize for your work. Don't apologize. Yeah. It don't even look like you may be thinking as to whether or not it's going well. Yeah. In fact, a little overconfidence, uh, ignorance is bliss, perhaps, to, yeah. to your surroundings uh, may be a valuable yeah. trait to have. One of the things you commented on, in the research anyways, um, perhaps not previously <laughs> for public <laughs> consumption, but we're going to make a point of it now. Okay is uh, the transition or evolution rather from your earlier days in improv to the current days which seem to be a little more uh, cockiness on stage from the performers um did you mean as opposed to basic humility that used to be part of the tra training and teachings now what did i say <laughs> <laughs> well I, I, i've noticed this from all performers yeah. and let's let me let me draw my own um analogy. Bill Murray beget a great many performers. Uh, his style and rhythms uh, reinvented a couple of wheels. But it, one of the byproducts that he beget would, let's say, uh, uh, Craig Kilborn, who admitted often that he, he drew his own on-camera persona from yeah. what he perceived to be. I'm just going to turn the smugness up to, you know, rather than the yeah. degree of smugness that yeah. Bill had, I'm going to turn it up to 11. But the problem, of course, from for, I think, organically, is that Bill Murray looked like the ass of a basset hound for the most part. Damn proud of it. But um, more more truthful, uh, more of an everyman. Yeah. I don't know that you could turn up the smugness when you begin with handsome. Right. And, uh, it just comes off as petty arrogance as opposed to why is this dog faced boy so ridiculously confident? You know what I mean? Yeah. I just saw uh, Judah Friedlander do a set in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, I was there for the Pittsburgh Comedy Fest with my improv partner, Rich. And, uh, Pittsburgh Ju has a comedy festival? They sure. This was the first one. Wow. Yeah. That's where Jamie's from. I, I, I heard that before the show. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, you going downtown to uh, watch Stillers? <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Appreciate uh, the effort. Got, a, got that a lot. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. Because uh, you have that Pittsburgh game you always play in this show, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Well, we, we play <laughs> Three Degrees from Ambridge <laughs> is the name of the game. Uh, but uh, but it, it was great to see Judah's set, which is uh, has elements of improv to it. And his whole thing is just like, I'm the world champion. You know, whatever you are, I'm better than you at it. Yeah. And he just does crowd work. And it's just this ridiculously nerdy guy. and Being uh, ridiculously confident. Being ridiculously confident. And, you know, comedy comes from the, the underdog, you know. Comedy doesn't come from a place of superiority or, or, or smugness. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, when, uh, when Fox News has tried to do comedy Oof. it's like it like oh you can't just say mean things and say it's comedy yeah <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and laugh at the end <laughs> like, let's let's make fun of people who are you know uh underprivileged in some way yeah um but i think at least what i tell improvisers you just need to have that blend of cockiness and humility in mm -hmm. terms of you need to know that you have something to offer that nobody else can offer right uh that you are unique and you've got your own voice but then it's also not about you you know you're part of an ensemble it's about giving over to your partner making them look good right and knowing that the the work is bigger than you in some way and you always need to be trying to get better yeah. at it so it's it's another one of those yin yang things i think all right um, I'm being told by one of our producers it's time that we thank uh, one of our sponsors, TXMQ. Sammy, I'd like to give you an opportunity while I search for the ad copy to <laughs> ask our guests anything you would like. Um, is there a way uh, that without properly going to any sort of improv training that I can just do improv with great <laughs> improv uh, performers? You on, can, on a regular basis. 
you can just start showing up yeah. at the time where you know the show is. Okay. <laughs> Go backstage, yeah. and improvisers are way too polite to be like, oh, dude, you're not in our show. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> no, I improvisers know. are kind of... You're You're 100% correct. You are not wrong. There are many times I would go backstage at the UCB in New York yeah. before ASCAT, and performers would be hanging around from either previous shows or teaching classes earlier in the day, and they'd just be like, oh, okay, so we have... Oh, we got 13 tonight. All right, it's going to be a little crowded, but we'll make it work. Nobody knows who's supposed to be in the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, like, it it could literally be just a, a group of strangers <laughs> that you've never seen before. And up to the point of just like them being called out on stage, you just go out with them. They're not going to stop the show and be like, uh, audience, uh, this guy is not in our troupe. Yeah. I don't know how he yeah. got here. Right. Uh, they'll just roll with it. Okay. So like, I think that's, that's the number one way. And they're asked and answered. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Craig. Knew I could count on you, and thank you, Craig. Yeah, just show up. Um, I'm going to read today's copy as one of the original members of Second City, Alan Arkin. Mm. TXMQ has been an IT solutions company for over 35 years. TXMQ huh, offers middleware and applications integration, platform solutions, and services... Professional staffing and ECM and web portals as well. And, you know, so much more than I personally understand as I'm reading this to you now. Stop running your company at half production speed, idiots. And simply head on over to txmq.com or call 1716. There are seven more numbers. I'm going to read them to you now. 636-0070. I hear you. You're asking me to repeat it. I hear you. I'm sensitive to this. I'm going to go ahead and repeat that now. One. That's way out in front of the other numbers. There's ten more, <laughs> but one. You want to start with one. 716 let them explain it all one hell of a lot better than I can. If you think they might have what you're looking for and what your business is lacking, please let TXMQ create a better and easier way of doing business for you today. That's TXMQ, an IT solutions company for over 35 years. Uh, favorite Alan Arkin film? I, I want to warn you, there is a correct answer to this in Kevin's eyes. Oh, really? Yeah. The in-laws, it's got to be. Correct, right. continue. Small <laughs> Jews for 400. <laughs> <laughs> Though I loved his performance in, uh, is it called 13 Conversations About One Thing? Yes. He was fantastic in that. That was probably my favorite performance of Alan Arkins, but The In-Laws is his funniest movie, I would say. Yeah, he's one of those, uh, for me, fl flawless performers that yeah. has never been anything shy of great. I'm sure you know what his biggest claim to fame outside of the acting world is. Please continue. In, in the music world. Oh. He wrote the Banana Boat song. Yeah. 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 We, um, <laughs> we, we had him on the show and I asked him about it. Really? And he could not want to distance himself really? further from, <laughs> from that <laughs> historical fact. Really? He doesn't yeah. sign the royalty checks? Well... I don't know that he gets as many as you think he might. <laughs> Dale! Yeah. Now you got to pay him. Well, it turns out that that um, it, it's 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 expanded beyond the initial uh, state of affairs. Sure. And it has become a little more apocryphal. Okay. He's the one not getting the checks. He's the uh, one that didn't necessarily singularly write the. So it's uh, a sore subject for him. Yeah. <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> I did meet him at the Second City 40th anniversary. Also true. Uh, yes, is that in your research? <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, and yeah, that was really cool to have him come backstage after our show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and he liked one scene <laughs> that uh, that me and, and my buddy wrote, uh, which like at this time like everything's just like fast paced and just like needle drops, you know, and, and funky transitions with strobe lights and yeah. stuff like so it couldn't be further removed from what they were doing when they would do like twenty minute scenes. It'd be like, I liked that one scene with you and the guy. It was like a people scene. Yeah. <laughs> we used to do people scenes. Right. Yeah. That was his take on it. Um well, again, speaking of historical value, 
Jamie and I have become uh, serious devotees mm. of a television program called Drunk History. You seem to be a uh, regular cast member, utility player, and I'm guessing wildly uh, underpaid yet appreciated <laughs> member of the Drunk History team. That could not be more accurate <laughs> all the way across. Yes. I'm That's one of those things where I just kept showing up and they just kept putting me in stuff. So improv rule number one. Here it is. Uh, yeah, that show is just as much fun to do as it looks like. Yeah. Uh, I'm in, I was not in the pilot, but I've been in every episode since. So like this season we had uh, 10 episodes, three stories in episodes. So we had 30 days of shooting and I worked every day. Uh, and it, it's so much fun. Every day I'm in a different beard, yeah. different wig, different historical era. Well, we have a question live from the interwebs, oh. um, from the Twitter. Uh, Sean at S-B-A-Y-L-E-S-01. Not a... S. Bayless. S. Bayless. S. Bayless 01. What is your favorite fake facial hair that you've worn for drunk history? This one was dictated by the script. Sure. Uh, it was for the Nellie Bly episode with Laura Dern. Uh, and uh, J.D. Uh, Risner was the uh, drunk for that one. And he had a thing. Uh, the, the guy, the sexist guy who wrote the article that inspired Nellie Bly to be a, a reporter. Right. I played that guy. And so he had that guy, or she, he had Nellie Bly saying, look, stupid 1880s guys with your mutton chops connected to your stupid mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally had like a handlebar mustache that went all the way out <laughs> and then gigantic mutton chops that came down and met that mustache. So that was easily my favorite. Yeah. But the, the hair and makeup department and, and wardrobe is ridiculous what they have to do because every day, you know, they could go from, uh, you know, Sugar Hill Gang, you know, 70s, you know, tracksuits right. and gold chains to, uh, you know, Madison versus Adams and having to do Colonial Williamsburg yeah. garb so that they're terrific. Well, I for those folks uh, listening and not watching, you have uh, a pretty healthy uh, growth of facial hair. As we speak, thank you. I'm assuming this is real. Uh huh. During production, you have to be clean shaven. I am clean shaven, so they can put beards on me. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you're not wearing the tube when you shoot. I take it. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to be clear that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we do another thing on the show where we ask uh, the audience to write in some live, uh, multiple questions for the guests. These are five okay. questions. Okay. And they are uh, carefully and specifically designed for you. The uh, the be a this or that, a Coke or Pepsi for each of them. Okay. Uh, and of course, um, you. Uh, this one is written from the Twitterverse as well. From. You want to get take a shot on the name that Mike. You don't know Mike Sabosley? Oh no, it's Mike Sabosley. <laughs> Do you know who that is? Yes. He's my old boss. He is your old boss. <laughs> yes, yeah. What's he doing in the chat room? I don't know. I saw, I was like, Mike Savosley. Well, I'm going to put this through. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. Um, so this is called a uh, Tweet 5. Cue the graphic, please. T5, T5, T5 forever now. Thank you, Dave Keckner, for singing the wonderful Tweet 5 song. Um, are you ready, sir? Yes. Here we go. And uh, no reasoning or clarification, just my answer? If you feel the impulse okay, to feel, share a okay. reasoning and or clarification, okay. please have at it. Great. Number one, watching NFL football or being on a podcast? Being on a podcast, specifically Kevin Pollock's I feel like show. that's an attack on the show, <laughs> the first question. I feel like it's an attack on football. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, NFL football, it, it's, it's on every Sunday for, uh, for four months. Sure. So this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah, and then also the password is DVR. Although not a word. Earbuds or headphones? Number two. Headphones. Earbuds fall out of my stupid big ears. Me too. Yeah. I have to. And then everyone makes, like, people make fun of me. They're like, what's up with your Walkman headphones? And I'm like, I need these. I can't. Earbuds. I go to the gym. I wear giant headphones. <laughs> like, uh, like, who's the, like, Blaupunkt <laughs> headphones. Uh, just to avoid people talking to you with that douchebag voice that she does. Yeah. And when asking, what's with the? What's with the? <laughs> yeah, I get told the what's with the Walkman headphones. <laughs> yeah. Question number three. 
Healthy or unhealthy cereal? <laughs> uh, healthy. I'll go granola. Will you? You know, some blueberries in there. Mm-hmm. Though I love peanut butter crunch. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah, it just tears open the roof of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Not since Captain Crunch. No, yeah. That's yeah. what he means. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Captain, the Captain made it. He made the peanut butter crunch. Yeah. Uh, questions or tweet fives is your question number four. <laughs> Which you prefer? Little, the conversation so that low. you and I were having. It's <laughs> <laughs> too much. Mike thinks he's clever. It's meta. If it's gone meta. It's very meta, yeah. This yeah, is... Mike, thanks for the cleverness. <laughs> <laughs> this question is very much in its own asshole now. Uh, I liked what, before when we were talking and it sounded like humans. <laughs> really? <laughs> like listening to each other. And, Interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, Talking, uh, going back to your your headphones, earbuds problem. Please, I got to tell you, there is a company out there who I'm sure would love to be a sponsor of this com of this podcast. By the name <laughs> of it's it's called uh, Sure S H U R E. Sure. And they uh, <laughs> they're uh, they're headphones earbuds people. Okay. And they have a product where uh, at at home you stick a thing in your ear and it molds to the shape of your ears, whether they be giant or small, uh-huh. and you send that back to the company and they send you personal earbuds for your ears and your ears alone that will not fall out. Wow. I own a pair, and i got to tell you, they're just fantastic. Okay. Are they fantastic, Sammy? They're just fantastic. You're not trying to get another pair right now. If they <laughs> wanted to send me another pair, I've had the first one since 2007. So have you researched the following? Do they have a microphone on them, too? Uh, I, I'm sure they'd have one now. Like that, yeah. uh, do you have proof positive that when you put those molding uh, devices into yeah. your ears... Yep. They didn't release small little microbe uh, happiness eating uh, earworms, microbes, Microbes, yeah, (laughs) into your brain. I'm quite sure that that's what happened. Okay. Uh, Have you noticed a change in personality in in Sam? Since? Since 2007. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't want to say it, but right before we started doing this show, about a year and a half before we started doing this show. Yeah. Something was wrong? I, t- I saw a turn. <laughs> a slight turn. From a happy drunk yeah. to a mean drunk. Yeah. Um, and your final tweet five, sir. Yes. Being wildly topical, Ray Rice or Adrian Peterson? God. I know, right? <laughs> Luckily, I did not draft either of those guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll go with uh, Jamal Charles. Nice. <laughs> who was my starting running back on my fantasy team. And how's that working out for you? Uh, he had four points last week. I understand you need more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand at all. Um, ch- foolishly choosing life rather than being in a fantasy football league. <laughs> but <laughs> No, you've chosen wisely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have chosen poorly. Uh, you're also uh, on one of my other absolute favorite shows, Veep. The Veep? Yeah. yeah. Man, do I love that show. Uh, Good terrific. Lord. I did one episode. Uh, How much improvising were you doing? A lot of improvising, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's Matt Walsh was here. And he was oh, man. Yeah. Uh, Matt Walsh, uh, another buddy of mine from Chicago, uh, idol of mine. Great uh, to see what he's gotten to do on that show as yeah. well, because he's fantastic. Um, it's interesting. I improvised in the audition. You know, they had sides for the audition for the character. And uh, Julia, my buddy Julia, uh, JLD, was in the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, of course, I'm referring to the <laughs> star of the show. Um, but uh, Armando, the uh, creator of the show, I did the sides as written, and he was like, okay, great, put those down. Uh, now, would you like to meet the vice president? Uh, and so I improvised about a five minute scene with Julia uh, in the audition. And there's nothing better, as you know, than actually getting to work off of another actor yeah. in an audition. Yeah. Uh, and then when I showed up four months later to shoot the thing in Baltimore, Things that I had improvised in the room at the audition ended up in the script. And so you called the WGA. <laughs> I'm like, writer's credit. <laughs> no, there's, there's nothing. I uh, have one question about the audition with um, aforementioned JLD. During the audition scenes, when you were acting and committed and improvising wonderfully and playfully with her, was she given an Emmy? Yes, she was. Right. Yes. There apparently is an Emmy just for, like, best read in the room. Right. 
Uh, yeah, and we had to stop. She gave a speech. It was hilarious and charming. <laughs> touching. Yeah, it was touching. Sure. Too. Uh, yeah. A lot of Emmys that lady has. Yeah. Uh, but but then the writing, pr- I actually I flew out to Baltimore two weeks before we shot, and I rehearsed with the cast for a few hours, and then they did another draft of the script based on stuff we improvised that day. So they, they write through improv. However, on the day, they want you to say it the way that they finally wrote it. Oh, really? So they use improv as a writing device, and then they kind of lock it in. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, was it cool for you? Did you enjoy it? I loved it. Uh, and that's kind of the way we worked at Second City as well. You would re-improvise scenes, re-improvise scenes. You never like brought in a sketch of like, hey, I wrote this, and you're going to play this, and you're going to... You just improvised until it became locked in your head, and then once... The, the scenes were kind of locked in. You'd open the show and say, hey, this is our new sketch comedy review. That's how Second City has always worked right. uh, from the beginning. And so it was a process that I was pretty comfortable with. And just and I guess the Arma- Armando, the creator of the show, that's how he's always worked uh, on the, uh, the thick of it and all his shows in uh, England as well. And it's a process that works for him. And he's not precious about the stuff that he wrote. Right. He wants his actors to be able to put it in their own words. That's the best which kind. Which is pretty great. Yeah. Um, are you enjoying your time on what they call Twitter? The Twitter, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> there's only uh, there's one forty characters that you can use. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about. I wasn't sure. <laughs> if you put an at sign uh-huh. before your tweet, it'll right? send it to the person. Oh boy! And if you want to know uh, like a topic, <laughs> you know, then you put a pound sign in there. I see what you're saying. <laughs> and you can also do cutesy things like smiling, pound sign smiling, and stuff like that. Are you familiar with the game Who Tweeted? Oh yeah. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Are you uh, emotionally prepared to play? It depends who the three options are, I guess. But well, yeah. first yeah. let's roll. Uh, yeah. Wait, Sammy, you ready? I, I am ready. Roll that intro. Roll the intro. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're going to play. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now... Before we continue on, Sam, yep. no, forgive, something important. Forgive just me up. for interrupting, but Mike, who wrote that last uh, tweet five, uh, technically now a friend of the show, mm-hmm. was uh, kind enough to share with us that uh, certain player that you've invested a little too much of your time in. That's just devastating. <laughs> has been injured. Now, it's interesting about my fantasy whole team football. is based around. Him. <laughs> what were the other choices? The child abuser or the wife abuser? <laughs> I guess I'll go with the. Ch- can he be his kid? I don't know. <laughs> oh, Here's dude. what I love about fantasy football, by the way. <laughs> you instantly care so much less about this player's uh, me- uh, physical health than yes. you do the, what he's done to your team. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Sam, what have you? Oh, well, we, we've got a very exciting edition of Who Tweeted Tonight. I think you're going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you see, because you are so wonderful on the aforementioned Drunk History on Comedy mm-hmm. Central... Uh, Jamie's decided to go with three other stars from the Comedy Central annals. And they are Amy Schumer. Love it. Okay. Jordan Peele, who I think you know well. Yes. And Daniel Tosh, who I bet you don't know at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is that those, Tosh? That yes. is Daniel Tosh. Okay. Or Tosh 2.0. I didn't know his first name. Yep. And now you do. Okay. It was on a need to care basis, I think. <laughs> That's what I'm sensing. Need to care basis, yeah. Yeah. So those are our choices. Amy I like Schumer. the Tosh program. Yeah. I don't know. I don't hate it. I know you do. Jordan Peele, <laughs> Daniel Tosh. You also love the wackiest videos or whatever that was thing that Saget hosted. America's, America's funniest, funniest Home Videos. Well, granted, we whenever that aired, we were like seven. No, but isn't it the same <laughs> premise? Yeah, isn't that basically yeah. what Tosh 2.0 is? We're looking at videos of people fucking up. No, no because it's because of YouTube videos. On yeah, on uh, on America's Funniest Home Videos, it was like, oh, the girls were trying to perform a play and the one slipped, and isn't that hilarious? On Tosh Point oh, it's like, oh, that guy was trying to make a three pointer and his leg split in half. <laughs> so, yeah, so of course, because these are modern times. Yeah, I understand that we need much more. It's more of a blood sport. They never could have shown the videos they show on Tosh on America's Funniest Home Videos. Right. I'm simply suggesting that it's not done a great thing for my brothers and sisters in the Writers Guild of America. No, it certainly mm. hasn't. Okay. And neither, uh, well, that's a whole separate thing. I All right, let's get back to the game. I soapbox about actors coming up with great lines that wind up in the script. But <laughs> I won't. So here is uh, how the game is played in case you're unfamiliar. Uh, one at a time, I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. How many? Eight total tweets. If at any point during that tweet you feel you know who wrote it, you ring in by saying your name, which would be K 
Kevin or Craig, Thank and you. then I'll point to you. You've got three seconds to say either Amy Schumer, Jordan Peele, or Daniel Tosh. Okay. You could just say their first names also. Okay. You could say any portion of their name. The Shooms. The Shooms. You could say the Shooms. Or Call Shoe. Shooms. Or just Shoe. Shoe. <laughs> say Shoe. Uh, Ta. Yep. <laughs> Peely. <laughs> Or Peely. Peely. Craig Peely. So that would be an acceptable <laughs> Craig answer. Peely would be an acceptable oh, yes, answer. completely. Uh, <laughs> you ring in, you get it correct, you get yourself five points. You ring in, you are incorrect, you lose three. At the end of eight tweets, unless there is a tie, one of you will be walking away with this $20 bill. Oh. That one? That's an awfully big head that Andrew Jackson has on that piece of paper, by Still the way. Still Pete Gammons. So that's a little ratty story. of a bill. Old hickory. <laughs> Old hickory indeed. Let's get on with the game, kids. I couldn't agree with you more. Here right. we go. Tweet number one. Nordstrom's. More like Boardstrom's. <laughs> Kevin. Shums. Incorrect. So Why are you so happy that I got it wrong? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but Sam will celebrate when I am incorrect, <laughs> as if he, too, has money on it. I, I would have also said the shoes there. Uh, and you both would have been wrong. It was Jordan. Just it was Peely. Just because of a, a sexist assumption that yep. a woman would more be more likely to tweet about a department store. Yep. Uh, unfortunately have for you, you and I. Have you seen Joe Jordan Peel dresses? He is quite <laughs> da dapper. Like he's, right. he's got some nice. Yeah. He's got some he's nice, some nice duds. duds. Uh, Jamie, our head writer, also uh, designs these so that they're okay. not obvious. Mm. I forgot to point that out to you and apparently myself as well. <laughs> All right. Question number two. Tweet, tweet number, number two. two. Pretty shitty August. Craig. Daniel. I'm so sorry, no. <laughs> Why are you upset? He got it wrong like I did. Well, he, you know, um, he was trying. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Tweet number so we're, three. We're tied at negative three right <laughs> yes, now. Just yeah. so you're aware that was, that was also Peely. It's now oh. a six-question game. <laughs> Tweet number three. Right. As they say in sports. The catfish hosts are so lucky they get to see the best parts of America. Are you guys familiar with the show? Catfish, it's an MTV program where they you know track what? down people who are pretending to be other people on the internet. That's what Kevin Craig. Tosh. I'm so sorry, no. <laughs> Again, so, uh, that's the shooms. <laughs> that was the shooms. <laughs> there, there's no follow-up. You just okay. let me Great, suffer. I'll let you suffer. Yeah. Dumb. Um, You're not doing so well, boys. Tweet number four. <laughs> Last week, we got them all right. Just about. This, yeah, yeah that's account. right. One out of eight. One this of week, uh, 0 for 3. Good luck, sir. Tweet number four. If you're wearing white today, I hope you burn in hell. I'm assuming this was written on Labor Day. Or after. Uh, Craig, Tosh. That's correct! Oh, that's so exciting. Mm, Motherfucker. You're out of the hole. Two... To negative six, tweet number five. I would be interested in trying to make love to Nicki Minaj. Kevin Schumer. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> Why is he <laughs> practically smirking? <laughs> that was also Tosh. Mm. So it's plus two to negative nine. Tweet <laughs> number six. Practically negative Nelly. Why is no one talking about my leaked photos? Kevin Schumer. That's correct. <laughs> He's so upset. <laughs> so, only, uh, only minus only minus four. four to okay. Plus two. All right. I'm Ooh, doing the math getting, now. It's exciting now. Tweet number seven. My phone autocorrected eight into R because it couldn't believe it. Kevin Peel. Oh, sorry. No. Ah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Schumer. Now, this last one being worth 10 points it means... Is, it is worth 10 points, which means, uh, should you get it, you'd technically be ahead 3-2. to two. Okay, wow. If I ring in and get it incorrect, you if win. You, if you ring, ring, ring in and, and get, get it, it incorrect, correct. you still win. Yeah. So it sounds like you should just ring the fuck in. Really, the only, you can guarantee a win by ringing in and, and no matter what happens. <laughs> okay. We really shouldn't have walked him through <laughs> it that far. Thank you for spelling it out for me. <laughs> you know, but if you're a sporting gent, yeah. <laughs> maybe you let him hang himself by his own uh, petard. <laughs> a lot of petard mentions right. on this program. I'm glad I'm bringing it back. <laughs> Not enough, anyways. <laughs> the eighth and final tweet. <laughs> Big Brother is like a sleepaway camp for sociopaths. Craig. 
Craig, Daniel Tosh. Well, we've already proven if you just ring in, you win. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to take a crack at that one, huh? No. I'm so sorry. As it turns out, that was Jordan Peele, but it doesn't fucking matter. Oh, yes, it does to, to me score, because he ends up with negative one. With a score of negative one to negative seven. And that's all I wanted. Yes. Two that, guys in the negative. Is that the lowest winning <laughs> score ever? No, probably, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. That's probably not. Last Congratulations. Yes. Score. That is how you play Who Tweeted. Well done, sir. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. What have you got there, Craig? Oh, it's a uh, crisp new $20 bill. Doesn't look that new to me. No, it's yeah, not. not crisp at all. <laughs> <laughs> it smells like Sam's hand. <laughs> and how would you describe that? Clammy. Clammy. <laughs> so, yeah. Clam so, Levine. So from the sea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> from the ocean. Yes. I see. Uh, do you see? Um... All right, so I've just got a few more follow-up questions about your uh, misdemeanor. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant uh, Thrilling Adventure Hour. <laughs> <laughs> You've been involved, of course, uh, I, I believe, as like our own Sam Levine, uh, practically from the beginning, if not the beginning. I, my very first show was the third one they ever did. This is back in the M-Bar days, mm -hmm. which was a, a ugh. I myself joined them at the M-Bar days. <laughs> Momentarily. Jamie's favorite. Uh, yeah. No, just Everyone's they, favorite. Because you were forced to order food and it was horrible. Yeah. Weird. Like, it, I got to the point where I was like, just charge me the $10. Yeah. Like, we I did. Want, yeah, $20 yeah. shitty spaghetti, yeah. basically. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, we, uh, we're coming up on 10 years in March of doing this show. And uh, these days it is which Saturday of every month at the uh, Largo Usually the Largo first, the but that changes sometimes. Sometimes the second Saturday, but usually early in so the month. So go to the website and look yeah. it up yourself. Yeah. Don't count on anything. I don't know. Yeah. I go up when they tell me to. The good news is you don't have to know. That's right. Okay. Um, and we were talking before we went on air about um, the uh, the incredible evolution of the audience where, Jamie, you were saying they cosplay now. Uh, they cosplay. They recite, like, they sing the theme songs. With, uh, uh, they have, like, they have motions now. Like, whenever, like, some, uh, like a certain word said, they, like, it's, it's crazy. They're rabid, rabid fans. There's a, a Tumblr devoted to the show uh, called F. Yeah, Thrilling Adventure Hour. And right now they're doing, for September, a 30 Days of Thrilling Adventure Hour challenge where every day people write in on the Tumblr of, like, whatever the question of the day is. Of like, favorite side characters, favorite quotes from Sparks Nevada, favorite merchandise that you bought. And so, uh, because I love to have my ego boosted, I've been mm -hmm. <laughs> going on every day and reading all these blog posts of, like, these fans think about the show and know more about the show than I ever will. You know, it's it's fascinating to see that level of devotion kind of grow over the years. Yeah. I and took a friend, I had a friend from out of town and I was, we were looking for something to do and I took him to the ninth anniversary show and he had never seen it before and he was like, he's like, I don't understand what's going on. It's so inside now. Like, yeah. it's like, I, it, uh, yeah, it was great. He like the only thing he got he got to go. What's the um the Dimaggio one? The Captain Laser Beam. Captain Laser Beam. Yeah, he's like that one was kind of a one off, and he's like, okay, I kind of understand what's going on here, but he's like, Sparks Nevada is like, I have no idea what's going on. Yes, <laughs> that's and got a pretty like, ornate yeah. mythology at this point. Yeah. Laser Beam's pretty much a straight up Batman, right. Adam West parody. <laughs> So, you know, of just plugging in a different villain and just a lot of puns mm -hmm. every time. So I think that'd be pretty easy for a neophyte to pick up on. So when's the next show? Live show at the Largo of the Coronet? Uh, first Saturday of October. And then we're you going think? To, I think so. Yeah. Uh, it better be because the following Saturday we're going to be in New York. So that would and be... And by we, you mean... My wife and I. Uh, <laughs> no, no, the show. Uh, we do New York a couple times a year now. We just do it. Sure. Uh, we're doing the Bell House in Brooklyn, where we've played several times before, uh, which is a great venue, about a 500-seat uh, standing room venue. You mean everyone stands? Everyone stands. Excellent. There are a few seats, but people are standing to see My two hours of My favorite way to comedy. see two hours of anything <laughs> is to be standing. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can't. Uh, there are seats. No, I'd prefer to stand. Yeah, if you would. Please remove them. <laughs> would be my first thing. I don't know. If it's between like sitting in the Largo seats or standing, I might go standing. Yeah. Are they pretty uncomfortable? It's like you got springs poking places I didn't even know existed. Yeah, yeah just a like shout out to Flanagan, the owner. Get some new fucking seats. <laughs> oh, they're also, for us short people, they're not... Um, Raked. Yeah. Not raked properly. It's all one level. Yeah. 
So yeah, it's they, like if you get they actually go up towards the theater, <laughs> so the every throw in front of you gets taller and taller. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Um, we uh, we've we've been fans for a long time. I've shared the stage with you yes. a few times, but I did notice each time you. Um, I don't want to say refused to talk to me, but it uh, certainly uh, it it felt that way, and so I thought I would just sort of uh, bring it up at the end of the interview, uh, as to not um, be too off putting during. Sure, just uh, all those awkward times. That the we've conversation, had yeah. Over the years. I'm glad we yeah. were able to at least get that behind. Yeah, us. Yeah, get some of the bad blood out of the way. Yeah, I think people talk about this one the way they talk about the Marin Louis C.K. podcast. Absolutely, <laughs> the amount of air that was cleared today. Yeah, I think so too. And if you want to come out, then we can uh, dole in the uh, Marin Todd glass. I'm going to stay in. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, you know how we wrap things up here on the show, uh, being an alleged fan. Uh, It's time to play the Larry King game. Uh, I I won't bore the viewers or listeners with the rules, but I will tell them to you to reiterate one more time if you would like. Sure. Okay. So I need a bad Larry King impression. I do not want a good one. Got it. Yeah, no problem there. Uh, And then I want you to uh, reenact that moment where Larry would go to the phones, but before doing so, he felt the need to stare down the barrel of the camera, in this case your camera, and tell the audience a little something about himself, his likes, his dislikes, his hobbies, his needs. But it was always a little piece of Larry that none of us, and I mean no one, needed or wanted to know. That's the moment you're reenacting, and then you go to the phones, and if the name of the city is funny sounding that you go to, ah, it's not going to hurt. All right. There's your camera. When you're ready, please enjoy. Larry King here. Join me next week live as I will be donating my sperm to help out the San Diego Wild Animal Park panda breeding program. (laughs) Goblins Creek, Missouri. You're on the line. (laughs) That is how you play the Larry King game. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um, We have a gift bag. Please remain seated. (laughs) Uh, again, thank you so much, Thanks, buddy. Craig. Honestly and truly been a fan a long time and thrilled to see you uh, continue success uh, with the drunk history and uh, and everything else, uh, honestly and truly. Thanks, um, sit there, please, uncomfortably, if you would, while I wrap things up for the folks at home and around the world. Um, next uh, Sunday, the 21st, this today being 9-14-14, uh, we'll be airing, uh, streaming a, um, a pre-taped uh, a chat we'll be having this coming Wednesday. If you have any questions or tweet fives for Joe Beth Williams, please send them to me at Kevin Pollack or at Jamie underscore Fox. Is there an A in there? How are you doing it? No, it's J-A-I-M-E underscore F-O-X. All right, or at Sam Levine. Feel free to throw all kinds of shit at Sam. That'd be awesome. That yeah, would make me would. happy. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to share that with her when we uh, do our pre-tape on Wednesday. And then in October from our new digs, wherever that might be, uh, Johnny Galecki and um, Kristen Shaw. Nailed it. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't be a bigger fan of it. It doesn't wonderful. sound like it. She's wonderful. Because I don't know how to pronounce her name. Uh, Kevin Polak. <laughs> Uh, Okay, so uh, until then, I will thank our staff that's been working so hard around the clock to make sure you get this fantastic show. Uh, That would be Samantha Ward on makeup, attempting to uh, uh, remove a few wrinkles from this particular aging Jew. You've got uh, Jason McIntyre, the research producer on the soundboard, Josh Negrin, cameras and lights, and TriCaster, and Kenny Chen, who I miss from in the studio. Yeah. Perhaps in our new digs, we can get him back in front of our faces. Would be better. So I yeah, can involve him. Yeah, we see all his fancy hats. At least wake him at some point during the show. That was always a favorite moment for me. <laughs> Danielle Overland, the media maven to the stars. Who am I leaving out? Great. Uh, uh-huh. David Mandel, the greatest intern that ever lived, refused to show up again today, so the hell with thanking him. Yeah. Uh, but I do thank you, each and every one of you. Write to us at contact at com. Until next time, and as always... Get out of my face.